worked as a mall Santa for the past few Christmases now. I'm only 33, but thanks to my complete lack of exercise routine, I definitely have the figure for it. And once I have the beard and the wig and hat combo going, there's basically no telling the difference between me and a 60-year-old dude. Mall Santa work can be tough for a few different reasons. Number one, the hours are really long and the pay can be really terrible depending on which mall you manage to get employed by. Number two, the kids can be little monsters and their parents can be just as terrible on occasion too. But the reason I'm actually considering skipping the entire thing this year and having something of a budget Christmas is that you get some seriously disturbing things happening from time to time. I mean, the kind of things that keep you up at night, even after a long, exhausting shift. However, the worst thing that's ever happened to me as a mall Santa was actually nothing to do with kids, parents, or terrible pay and hours, and I'm sure you'll see why after I tell the story. So every year, usually when the malls are quietest during weekday mornings, we get specially organized visits from special needs kids or adults with learning disabilities who are bussed in from the surrounding areas. Pretty much every other mall Santa I've spoken to about this agrees that it can be one of the most rewarding parts of the job, and that the adults with learning difficulties are often even more excited about the prospect of meeting Santa than some of the kids are. Literally the only downside is that some of them are so heavy that my thighs hurt after having like 50 in a row sit on my lap, but other than that, it's honestly one of the best parts of the job. Last year, I'm in the middle of one of the special sessions when I get this girl coming up and sitting on my lap. I say girl, but she was legitimately a grown woman, looking like she was in her mid-thirties or something, but she had the mental age of about nine or ten, all smiles and giggles, way shy about meeting Santa again. It was cute as all get out, but the interaction was not so cute, and turned that way pretty fast. So like I said, she's all giggles and smiles as she comes up to sit on my lap, and I give her the usual spiel, asking her name, how old she is, if she's excited for Christmas and all that stuff. Then, when it comes to asking her what she wants me to bring her on Christmas Eve, she starts thinking about it, smiling at first before she suddenly gets super serious with a touch of sadness. I'm asking her if she's okay, what the problem is, and she's like shaking her head, acting like she doesn't want to tell me anything. I take the time, and explaining that no matter what she asks for, I'll try my very, very best to bring it to her, no matter how big or small it is, that Santa always tries his best to bring good little girls and boys what they ask for on Christmas. She takes a moment, then the exchange goes a little something like this. You mean it, Santa? You can get me anything I want for Christmas? Anything. Anything you want. Just tell me and I'll do my best. Okay, well... And at this point she lowers her voice to a whisper and leans into my ear. I want my boyfriend to stop hitting me. Can you make that happen? I was sort of dumbstruck for a second. Like all of the things I thought she was going to ask, that would most definitely not have topped the list. I remember just nodding at first, trying to find the words, and being like, I'll make that happen for you, sure, no problem. She was so, so happy to hear that I'd fix it for her, and gave me the biggest hug I think I'd ever received while working as a mall Santa. I had to put on a huge smile, and of all the times I've had to fake being jolly and merry, that time with her was the hardest. But I just felt numb, like completely broken by what I'd heard, and I just tried my best to get through the rest of the session without bursting into tears. I remember all these thoughts rushing through my head, terrifying ideas of institutional abuse. She said boyfriend, and that made it extra creepy. Like sure, it could have been just another guy in her care group or something, another adult with learning difficulties who she'd hooked up with somehow, but there was nothing to say that it wasn't a member of her care team that was, like, abusing her, in a completely different sense too. Not just physically, but, well, you catch my drift. So when the session was over, I approached the member of the care team that had organized the trip and had accompanied them to the mall. I didn't let anything slip. I just told them how great I thought the session had gone and 
asked a few details about the group that had organized them. As it turned out, they were all from the same care home type thing, so I made a note of the name of the place as well as the name of the girl that was apparently being abused. That night, I couldn't sleep. I just kept picturing some evil monster abusing that poor girl, taking advantage of their position to put some poor special needs woman through torture, then telling her that she'd be killed if she ever breathed a word of it to anyone. And here's where stuff starts getting even more intense. Now, I could have just called 911 with the info I had at hand, registered a general complaint and then heard nothing back about it. But a buddy of mine had a cousin with the local police department and not just some gumshoe beat cop either. They were a detective. It took some convincing, but I convinced my buddy to pass along their cell phone number so I could get in touch with the dude personally. It took a little while, but I managed to get through to the guy. He sounded pretty skeptical at first and seemed kind of irritated that his cousin had even given me his number, but once I explained what the issue was, his tone changed completely. Now, I didn't find this out until way later from my friend that his cousin had a special needs daughter who was probably going to have to either live with them for the rest of their life or was going to head into a group home at some point so she could have some measure of independence. So when I explained the situation with the special needs girl I met as a mall Santa, it obviously hit the guy right in the feels as the topic was so close to home. The detective tells me that he'll look into it, thanks me for letting him know. I get him to promise to tell me if anything comes of it and he says yes and we hang up. And that was the last I heard of it for like a month. Then after maybe five or six weeks I'd almost forgotten about the whole thing. Christmas was over. The mall Santa job was way behind me and I was back to working my regular hours as a self-employed mechanic. Then I get a call from a number that seems vaguely familiar, although I wasn't quite sure why. Turns out it was my buddy's detective cousin, who reminded me of the tip that I'd given him about the care company. Of course I remembered, but by that time I really didn't think anything would come of it, but oh how wrong I was. The detective thanks me for the information and although he told me he couldn't say too much, he told me to keep an eye out on local media outlets. The next thing I know it's all over the local papers that there's been a misconduct scandal involving a local care company. I picked up a copy and read the story, only to find out that it's the very same one I had reported. The long and short of it is that the cops had uncovered endemic levels of abuse in the company. Stuff that varied from financial discrepancies to straight up physical abuse and sickeningly enough there was even cases of care workers taking advantage of mentally disabled females in ways that were seriously inappropriate. There were numerous arrests with some of the sleazier and violent criminals looking like they were going to get years in prison for how long they so cruelly taken advantage of some of the most vulnerable people in society. It made me sick to my stomach to read about how some people could bring themselves to do something like that, but it was stopped, and I felt incredible that I'd actually managed to be a part of the chain of events that brought the whole thing crashing down. I just hoped that that poor girl, who was obviously pretty traumatized by what was happening to her, and just not being able to understand why it was happening either, found some measure of peace after it. And in a way... Santa did kind of bring her exactly what she wanted, even if it wasn't on Christmas Day, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is a thought that never fails to make me tear up. So this happened all the way back in the late 1990s when I was a college sophomore. Me and the girl I was dating at the time had been going steady for about 8 months and since she was my first real girlfriend, my mom was pretty keen to meet her. And what better time than the holidays to introduce her to the folks. During the week before Christmas, my mom's family traditionally held quite a large gathering up at my uncle's place over in Sandy in my home state of Oregon. Pretty much all my extended family head out there year after year from all over the Portland area and since they've gotten word that I was bringing my girlfriend, the hype to meet her was huge. I won't lie, I was kind of nervous that they'd embarrass me in front of her, but that anxiety was totally misplaced. She got along really well with all of them, 
and despite some playful humiliation when the cousin of mine told her the story of how I literally peed my pants at the Haunted Mansion ride when I was a kid, they were a credit to me. And when it came to driving her back home, she seemed to be more into me than ever. We'd agreed to drive back down to Eugene at like 7pm so I wouldn't be too tired driving back, but since we had such a good time, we stayed way later than we had planned to and didn't get on the road until about 10.30pm that evening. In the hopes of making the journey a little faster, I ended up taking the OR211 instead of just sticking to the I-5S for the whole drive. Annoyingly, this didn't quite actually make the journey any faster, but point being, the OR211 was pretty much surrounded by farms or these huge swaths of dense pine forest. So as you can imagine, big stretches of it aren't lit very well at all, and for some parts of the drive, we were moving through complete darkness, saved only by our car's headlights. But honestly, I wasn't all worried about it. I was pretty good at reading a map, and once I was back on the I-5, a road I knew pretty well, I figured everything would be all good. So we're just cruising along, in high spirits, talking about how goofy some of my family were, but generally my girlfriend was singing their praises and telling how she couldn't wait to meet them again. It's right around then that we hit a section of the highway that descends down this big old hill, heading up to the bridge crossing over Deep Creek. There, the highway is sandwiched by some of the densest forests you've ever likely seen, and there is absolutely nothing lighting up the highway. It's the only thing we can see from the front seats of the car is like maybe 20 or 30 feet that our headlights are illuminating, and pretty much nothing else. But like I said, we're in high spirits, completely unprepared for what was about to happen. Right as the highway was starting to level off, Something darts across the front of us so fast and so suddenly that I barely miss smashing into it. I brake so hard that I almost gave the pair of us whiplash, then when we're stopped, both me and my girlfriend are in a complete frenzy of, Oh God, did you see that? What was that? There are plenty of deer in that area of Oregon, plenty of coyotes too, but the thing that ran out in front of us was way too big to be a coyote, and something about the way it moved gave me this gut feeling that it wasn't a deer either. The shape was just way too slender, almost like whatever was out there had moved on two legs, not four. Now next thing, I know how completely dumb this sounds in retrospect, but my curiosity just got the better of me and I decided I wanted to investigate. So again, this was also incredibly dumb, I turned the car like 90 degrees in the highway so I could point our headlights into the woods. Yes, this could have caused a horrible accident if another car had come along at the same time I was doing this, but I don't think I was thinking straight at the time. You see, as a kid growing up in the Pacific Northwest, I've heard a lot of stories about Bigfoot and Sasquatch, and I'd be lying if I said that they didn't capture my imagination. No, I'm not saying that I thought I'd caught a glimpse of Gigantopithecus or anything. I know the stories are mostly exactly that, just stories, but... A part of me just wanted to be sure. So like I said, I turned the car 90 degrees, turned on the high beams and stepped out of the driver's side and onto the highway. I stare off into the trees for a minute or two, but I don't see a thing. Nothing is moving out there, and the whole scene was as quiet as the grave. But as I'm looking, I get this feeling in the pit of my stomach and start to feel as if though I'd made a huge error of judgment. It was one of the most intensely terrifying feelings I'd ever felt in my entire life, a feeling like I was being watched by something predatory. I know it's a huge cliche and the whole I felt like I was being watched thing is such a tired old trope, but I don't really know any other way to phrase it. My heart was pounding, the hairs on the back of my neck are standing on end, and my gut just turned to ice. So without turning my back to the woods where I expected the danger to come from, I started edging back towards the car. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, I practically jump out of my skin when I hear the car's horn letting off one long, excruciatingly loud extended blast. I mean, it scared me so bad that I almost straight up peed my pants haunted mansion style. My first thought was that my girlfriend had ended up leaning on the horn as she climbed over into the driver's seat for some reason because she'd done that once or twice before. But as I turn back around, I can see she's still on the passenger side, but that she's actually leaning over to push the horn in what was evidently a frenzied attempt to get my attention. 
I run back to the car and ask her if she's okay, but she doesn't say a single word to me. She just points off to a spot about 50 feet away from where we parked. I spin my head around to see what she's pointing at, and that's when I see it. What was, without a shadow of a doubt, the thing that had run in front of our car just a few minutes prior. Lit up by the residual light of our high beams, what I saw was really obviously a man, but he was covered in animal furs, what looked like a mishmash of deer skins, bear skins, and elk skins, and on his head, secured in a way I'm not even sure of, were these antlers. At the time, because of how closely it was to the holidays, I remember the words reindeer man just flashed into my mind, maybe in the naive hope that the dude was dressed that way out of some misdirected festive spirit, but he certainly didn't seem in any kind of festive spirit, not in the least bit. Like I couldn't see his eyes because of the weird kind of head covering he had on, but I could see his mouth, and at first he kind of looked like he was giving us a smile, only as I looked I could see it wasn't a smile at all. This guy was just baring his teeth to us, like the way chimps do as some kind of warning. After that, he turned and walked off into the forest, never to be seen again. Obviously, right after that, me and my girlfriend just got out of there and got back onto the roads towards the I-5. It took us both a while to calm our nerves, but my girlfriend was particularly shaken up, and that's because she'd seen something that I hadn't. And as we drove on, she explained exactly what that was. While I'd been staring off into the woods, looking for Sasquatch or whatever, she'd noticed him out of her peripheral vision, but was basically frozen in fear for a moment or two as she watched him walking slowly towards me. Or rather, walking isn't the right word. From how she described it, this guy was stalking, the way a hunter might stalk a deer. The way she puts it, she had to summon up pretty much all of her courage to be able to lean over and honk the horn the way she did. Then when Reindeer Man had heard the honking, he backed off a little before I saw him and like I said, he kind of just froze in place before disappearing. I did a fair amount of online research when I got home to try and find out if anyone else had any run-ins with this guy, but there was absolutely nothing online about him. There are plenty of crazy survivalist types up here in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm guessing he was one of those, but they tend to be pretty open about their existence, sometimes even advertise themselves as militiamen or whatever, whereas the reindeer man seemed like he was living completely off the grid. I don't live in Oregon anymore. Me and my girlfriend during the encounter broke up at the end of college, but when we were still together and I happened to be driving down towards Eugene, I always avoided the stretch of highway that I saw the reindeer man on. I've told this story a lot over the years and some people honestly just think I'm making it up as like a campfire tale or something, but it's not a tale, it's not made up, and it's definitely not just intended to be some dumb spoopy story. It's most definitely a warning to anyone traveling on that road at night because if my girlfriend wasn't with me when he ran out in front of the car... If she wasn't there to spot him before he crept up on me, only to scare him off with a blast of the horn, I honestly might not be here to warn you guys. So please, this holiday season, drive careful, drive slow, and do not stop for any reason on dark, deserted stretches of forest highway. So a little bit of backstory. My great-grandmother's second husband was apparently a total sadist who systematically abused her grandchildren for many, many years in pretty much every way you can imagine. These grandchildren happened to be my dad and his sisters and it had a horrendous effect on them, as you can probably imagine. It was also totally unknown to anyone but them until quite a while after he died which coincidentally was around the same time that I was born. So as I said, the abuse had a really harsh effect on my family's collective psyche and made them vigilant to the point of paranoia when it came to protecting me from a similar fate. As a result, I was basically never allowed to play outside without strict supervision and I almost certainly was never allowed to go to sleepovers at friends' house when I was a kid. 
This story takes place back in the early 90s when I was about 7 or 8 years old. My family was living down in Florida just when the holidays were about to roll around. We were a very close family, for reasons I already stated, so my nana lived with us right up until the day she passed. She helped out around the house and with a lot of childcare stuff, so whenever I was home due to school holidays or whatever, she would look after me whenever my mom and dad had to work. I adored her with all my heart. She was just about the best nana that anyone could ever wish for, and she was tough as an old boot too. So this particular year, I was lucky enough to have gotten the one thing I really, really wanted Santa to bring me, a brand new pair of roller skates. I was obsessed with them, and from the moment I got them, I was itching to practice so I could get good enough to start going really fast or nail some tricks on them. One afternoon, I'm zooming up and down the sidewalk outside our house, getting better and better with each passing hour, while Nana is sitting on the porch and keeping a close eye on me in between bouts of reading a magazine or a book or something. Then at one point, the phone rings and Nana basically has no choice but to duck inside to answer it. I'm guessing she hesitated on calling me inside, knowing I'd kick up a fuss if I had to stop skating even for a minute, so... She must have figured that she could probably duck inside and answer the call without it being too much of a risk. But as she did, she kept the main door open so that she could still see me through the screen door. It took a minute or two for her to get back from the call, but nothing went down during that time, so I figured that gave her a little peace of mind that she didn't have to worry about me all the time. When she gets back, she goes back to reading her thing while I was hard at work learning to spin on the front or whatever trick I had my heart set on learning. Then after maybe another 45 minutes or so, she calls to me that it was time for a lemonade break and that we had to go inside. I remember begging her with everything I had to just please please let me skate for just a little while longer. I managed to bargain with her somehow, telling her I'd skate just for a few more minutes but also swearing that I'd come inside as soon as she'd made the lemonade, no ifs, ands, or buts. She kind of scowls at me for a second, probably silently cursing the fact that she couldn't quite say no to me whenever I begged her like that, but she eventually agreed before going inside to get the lemonade ready. But when she did, she tells me to sing as loud as I can so she can hear me from the kitchen and know I was still there. So I did as I was told and warbled all the boys to men lyrics I knew while I continued to skate up and down. Then maybe only a few minutes go by and I look up to see this big old van turn onto our street. It starts cruising along all slow, almost looking like they were lost or looking for something. But I mean, I didn't pay it any mind. I was a kid, naive, and besides, I was too busy being happy with my skates to really consider any danger it might pose. And on top of that, I was with my tough old Nana, and nothing could ever hurt me so long as she was around. Or at least, that's what I thought. So as it rolls up alongside me and slows to a stop, I just carry on trying my very best to twirl on the spot with my skates. And in fact, knowing me, I probably tried to show off a little given that I had an impromptu audience. The next thing I know, the passenger side of the van opens out and a very, very tall man steps out. I know everyone is tall when you've yet to hit 10 years old, but this guy probably towered over all the other grown-ups he was around too. He was skinny, he looked like a scarecrow and a skeleton's love child or something, just all gangly limbs with a shock of salt and pepper hair messily strewn across his scalp. I remember that specifically. He approaches me and asks me which way the highway is, and I just point it back down the street. I'm not even sure that was the right direction, but I just sure wanted to be helpful to a stranger. I remember he smiled and thanked me, and it was only then that I started to get nervous. It was his teeth. They were all discolored and crooked. I think most kids associate monsters with their teeth, maybe most adults too. I know I certainly do, and seeing that guy's teeth put the fear of God into me. But I tried to stay polite when he asked me how my Christmas went, showing him my new skates when he asked me what Santa had brought me that year. It was then that he told me that Santa had been extra generous to him and his family that year and had brought his daughter so many presents that she didn't even want them all. Now my family has always been close-knit, a loving and generous family with their money. They just never had a lot of it, so holidays for us was always pretty sparse affairs. 
Which is why when the scarecrow man told me his daughter got so much that she didn't even want some of her presents, I couldn't quite believe my ears. And when he actually offered me a Barbie-themed dollhouse, one I actually really did want, I almost forgot about how nervous I was of him. It wasn't enough to completely shake the fear out of me though, so when he told me he had it in the back of his van, asking if I'd like to come take a look, I just started skating away from him, shaking my head all silent. But instead of just shrugging it off and getting back into his van, he starts to follow me back towards my parents' place, asking where I lived, if my parents were home, that kind of stuff. We hadn't had any stranger danger lessons in school, so it was only out of pure instinct that I unlatched the gate to my parents' place and began to wail for my nana. No sooner had I let out the second cry than my nana appears with this big old cast iron pan in her hand and comes tearing up the path towards me and what I now know to be my potential abductor, and she's screaming bloody murder as she does so. I didn't see this at the time, but from what my mom told me years later at my nana's funeral, this guy takes one look at nana, soils his pants, and just bugs out of there as she chases his van up the street. I do remember seeing her swinging that pan around and telling him to come back so she could beat him black and blue, and as much as her display of furiousness freaked me out, I was just grateful that she could be twice as scary as Scarecrow Man had been. The way my mom tells it, Nana had tried to get the van's tag number only to find it didn't have one. The guy was a predator through and through, and had obviously been prepping and gearing up to kidnap a kid, for whatever reason that may be. Next thing I know, the cops at our house, my dad had come home early from work, and I'm having to tell people over and over what that guy looked like while they write down things and ask me a zillion questions about the color of the van, the guy's clothes, like every little detail you could possibly think of. Needless to say, I didn't get to go out on my skates again for the rest of the holidays. So like I mentioned, this whole story came up in my Nana's funeral when we were telling tales about her. And the one really freaky thing about the whole incident, and something I didn't know until years and years after, was that when me and Nana described the Scarecrow Man to the cops, they both shot each other a look like, holy God. Before telling Nana and my dad, I was out of the room by that point, that we pretty much just described another one of their perps to them, to a T. We described a guy that had made several other attempts at kidnapping kids in broad daylight over the holiday period, a guy that they were desperate to get their hands on because they knew it was just a matter of time before his luck turned and he managed to trick a kid into getting into his van. Knowing I could have been that kid, knowing I could well have been dead before my 10th birthday, having endured unimaginable torment before I was finally put out of my misery, it's something that makes my skin crawl, even to this day. During college Christmas break of 2016, I had traveled all the way back to Pennsylvania from California to spend the holidays with my parents. It was kind of weird going from being a mostly independent college kid in a place that hardly ever gets cold, to going back to living in my childhood bedroom in a state that becomes a legit winter wonderland around December and January. But I love my mom and dad, and I don't care how much the flight costs, there was no way I was going to spend the holidays alone in Cali. So anyway, my old room is on the second floor of the house, directly above the sliding door that heads out onto the decking in our backyard. It's a really heavy door, so anytime someone opens or closes it, it rumbles right up into my bedroom. This was in a house that was built back in the 50s too, so as you can imagine, the whole place has a lot of creaks and groans to it, but is otherwise pretty sturdy. I should also add at this point that part of the town that my parents live at is pretty safe, with a relatively low crime rate, especially to that of nearby Philly. The most intrusive calls they ever got tended to be from magazine salespeople and the odd Jehovah's Witnesses, and after my dad insisted on debating scripture with them, they stopped calling altogether. Point being, they never had anything remotely close to any kind of break-in or home invasion for the entire time they were living in that property. Next thing is a brief confession from myself here. I picked up a pretty horrible smoking habit during my freshman year of college, 
so whenever my parents went to bed, I tended to stay up late playing Civ on my laptop, sitting next to my open bedroom window while I smoked and drank tumblers of scotch that I would pilfered from my dad's liquor cabinet. After midnight, I'd have my window open from anything of 30 minutes to 2 hours. I mean, it would purely depend on how cold it was outside or how tired I was, but I generally let the room air out before spraying some air freshener so that the tobacco smell didn't cling to anything too bad. I also had to use headphones to watch TV and listen to music so it wouldn't wake my mom and dad up. But I tend to only ever use one earphone so I could keep an ear out for anyone coming down the hallway, since they really wouldn't be happy if they found I was smoking in the house. So one night, I was in my usual routine of conquering the known world in an online multiplayer game of Civ when our house alarm suddenly starts blaring. I don't think I'd heard that thing since I was about 6 or 7 years old, and I had completely forgotten about how loud it was. So hearing it had me practically filling my underwear from being frightened out of my skin. Point being, everyone in the house is now wide awake and ready to head off whatever is about to go down. Now my priorities might sound way, way off here, but initially my big worry wasn't so much that something bad might be happening, like a home invasion or something like that. It was more like me being terrified that my parents were about to realize I'd been smoking and stealing booze from them. I was 20 years old at the time, technically underage, and my parents were old-fashioned types, real sticklers for the rules. If they found out what I'd been doing, there'd be drama and lots of it. But somehow, when my dad stuck his head around my door all bleary-eyed to make sure he knew where I was, he didn't seem to smell anything. I don't know whether this was because he was too tired and freaked out about the alarms to notice or that he noticed and actually just didn't care, but either way, he told me to go into their bedroom and stay with my mom until he could give us the all clear. So my dad goes downstairs, I'm assuming with pistol in hand, and gets to work clearing the house, as well as checking the front and backyards to make sure that there's no one hiding in the darker areas out there. He comes back up, tells me and my mom he couldn't find anything and it was probably just a false alarm, and then we all head back to bed. Or rather, they went back to bed. I just went back to being a diplomatic genius on Civ 6. About an hour goes by and I start getting pretty tired, so I get up to close my bedroom window before heading to bed when the alarm goes off again. Once again, my dad goes downstairs, does a sweep of the grounds floor and the yards, then comes back to tell me not to worry and that he figured it was just the wind or something. I mean, it had been a pretty windy night, which honestly suited me because it meant the breeze aired my room out. Like I said, it was an old house, so it wasn't out of the question that the wind could have rattled the doors or windows and set the alarm off. The point being that both me and my dad were chill about the alarm going off. Neither of us thought there was anything to worry about. So the next morning at breakfast, my dad is going through the alarm systems app on his iPhone, checking out some of the data readouts from the night before. All of a sudden, he's all like, Okay, that's weird. Apparently the backsliding doors were open 14 times last night. Number one, I was impressed the alarm system was so sophisticated that it could feed him that kind of info. I guess he shelled out big boy cash for that thing. But number two, how could it have been open that many times? Then I'm not kidding, like five to ten minutes later there's a knock at our front door and it's the neighbor guy from the house down the street. He asks us if we had any intruders over the previous night and we tell him no or that at least we didn't think so. It's then that he tells us that he actually caught someone on a security camera trying to break into his house that the dude had tried to jimmy a lock or something before looking right up into the camera before getting spooked and bailing. We assumed that this was about the time that he moved on to our house, then capped at it when he realized it was the weaker target. That seriously freaked me out. The whole time I'd been sitting there, innocently playing games, sipping stolen scotch, there had been a guy trying to get into our house, maybe only six or seven feet below me. If I'd have bothered to look out the window at any point and directly downward, I'd have locked eyes with the guy. He must have smelled my cigarette smoke, known someone was home, and it just didn't bother him in the least bit. He was more than prepared to face off with someone, although apparently not when he'd seen my dad with his pistol, sweeping the house in yards in the dark. 
I've always liked a scary story or a good horror film. Ghosts, vampires, werewolves, they're my jam. I've never found, like, serial killers or whatever to be that scary, though. Like, I didn't think that the human element to the horror was particularly potent. After that night, though, that all changed. It struck me how evil and predatory human beings can really be. How that guy had been creeping around in our backyard for basically hours right under my nose, and I had absolutely no clue he was there. It's how he managed to just disappear when the alarm went off, too, and how he had the balls to come back once we'd all gone back to bed. I mean, he was like a ghost or something, just vanishing into the darkness. I mean, think about it. My dad had checked out the backyard, tried to make sure that there was no one hanging around, hiding out in the dark spots underneath the trees, and there had been. There had been someone there, just watching my dad walking around in his slippers or whatever he had on, just waiting for him to call off the search before creeping back up towards the house. Just thinking about it now gives me shivers. And now that I'm back in Cali writing this, I always make sure that all the windows and doors in my dorm are locked, and that I double or triple check whenever I think something bad is about to go down or whatever. Because sometimes it seems you'll never know if someone is just lurking in the shadows until it's way, way too late. A few Christmases ago, I was driving my kids back from visiting their grandparents out in the countryside. They moved out to this big old house once my dad sold his business, one of those offers he couldn't refuse type things that meant he could retire like 10 years earlier than expected. The house is amazing, but the only problem is that it's in the middle of nowhere, the kind of place where the nearest village is like 20 minutes drive away. It's also one heck of a drive to and from the place, one that involves traversing some pretty secluded stretches of motorway. So like I said, it's maybe only a week before Christmas. It's the 16th or 17th of December, and my kids are really bloody excited about it. My wee lad is still five years old, a true Santa believer, while my daughter had only just turned nine, so they're starting to cotton on that something isn't quite right about the whole thing, but they still sort of want to believe, if that makes any sense. So when they see a hand-painted Christmas light dripping sign that says something like Santa's Grotto nine miles, they start going ballistic in the back seat, demanding I take them to see Santa. At first, I straight up refuse. It was a long enough drive without pulling into some lay-by to spend the better part of an hour nattering away with some old fella in a red suit, but the pair of them throw an absolute fit to the point where I decided I would get far more peace if I just capitulated and let them spend a few minutes indulging their childish imaginations. Like I said, my eldest was just on the cusp of figuring out that Santa was just mum and dad sneaking out in the middle of the night to take their presents out of the car boot before stashing them under the Christmas tree. And every time I imagined her getting older, getting wiser, figuring things out, becoming a young adult, it had me choking up like nobody's business. So I suppose I just wanted to enjoy the naivete just a wee bit longer. Besides, once she'd figured out the truth, it was only a matter of time before she spilled the beans to my youngest. And that was a day I most definitely wasn't looking forward to. So after a few more signs like Santa's Grotto 3 miles, I finally see the turn off that I needed to take to get to the grotto. It takes me down this long, dark, dirt track that at first I thought might have been the wrong turn off. But lo and behold, after about five minutes or so, I see another one of those janky hand-painted signs for Santa's Grotto. The kids are just about ready to burst at this point, but I make it clear that we're not staying any longer than ten minutes, and they're to be on their best behavior, leaving when I tell them to leave, lest Santa see what bad the little children they are. The threat of coal in their stockings was more than enough to have them promising to be good, Anyway, I expected a quaint little winter wonderland type thing with a few other families milling around, but the place was barely even decorated and looked completely deserted. It was little more than porta cabin with a few caravans parked around it. Like, I'm not messing when I say whoever was in charge of this place had put more effort into decorating the road signs than the actual site itself. I had a bad feeling from the get-go, but I knew better than to reverse myself and tell the kids to get back in the car, 
they'd have gone absolutely mental getting so close to meeting Santa, only to be told that I'd just up and changed my mind. So, against my better judgment, I decided to give the place a chance. We walked up to the porta cabin, which seems to be the place where the grotto was, and knocked on the door. There was no reply at first, so we knocked again, and as we did so, one of the doors to the caravan swings open, and this heavier set older fellow with a big grey beard sticks his head out and gives me a death stare. I look over at him, and in my cheeriest voice, I ask, We're here to see Santa. Is he around? I give a quick nod towards the kids as if to say the fella who I was guessing was the one playing Santa to get himself together so the kids wouldn't throw a fit. He doesn't say a word at first. He just stares at me almost like looking through me like there was nothing behind his eyes at all. He finally says something like, I'll go fetch him. Then shuts the door only to re-emerge a few moments later dressed in what was without a doubt the worst looking Santa suit I've ever seen in my life. Not only was it lacking any kind of white felt, there was no belt or anything. The bloke had pretty much just thrown together a collection of red clothes and then whacked on a cheap Santa hat to round the look off. On top of that, the clothes were absolutely filthy, covered in grease stains with a collection of what appeared to be his cigarette burns in the pants. He walked towards the kids and asked them if they were excited to see him. They gave each other this cartoonish look as if to say, Who is this guy? and the bloke has to repeat the question in a characteristically festive voice before they even really twig to the fact that this was Santa Claus. They just sort of nod at first, watching in confusion as he takes out the key from the red pants and unlocks the porta cabin before beckoning them inside. The interior was absolutely terrifying. Like I'm a grown woman and even I got the creeps from stepping inside that thing. It was dark and grimy, and the use of cheap Christmas lights managed to give the place a kind of festive torture chamber type vibe, as opposed to the cozy grotto feeling they were obviously aiming for. The crowning piece of creepiness was the fact that, mounted on one wall, was what I guessed was an old sheep's skull that had some plastic deer antlers taped or glued to the top of it. It would have been creepy enough in broad daylight, but the fact that it was being partially then fully illuminated by red and green flashing lights gave it a truly hellish aesthetic. Santa sat down on a grubby old couch that stunk of pee and old ale, then smacked his knees as if to invite the kids to go sit on his lap. Neither of them moved. Their lack of reaction prompted Santa to give them something of a scowl before he very curtly asked them what each of them wanted for Christmas. Both of the kids were so nervous by that point that I had to prompt them to reply. The awkward exchange went on for a few more minutes until I turned to the kids and told them we had to leave. As I'm ushering the kids out of the porta cabin and back towards the car, I feel a hand grab the crook of my arm and squeeze. I turn to see Santa's face pushed right into mine, his breath reeking of ciggies and hard booze. Fifty quid, he hissed. Sorry, Santa. I haven't got anything on me, I said, trying to be as polite as possible, maintaining a passive-aggressive tone. But I promised me and my husband will leave out some extra brandy and mince pies for you on Christmas night, just to make up for it. I don't even know I was keeping up the pretense by that point. I'm pretty sure the whole experience had scarred my wee lad for life and had pretty much destroyed any remaining festive belief in my daughter. Santa growled back at me, calling me an expletive. I just keep pushing my kids back towards the car, turning back briefly to see that Santa is no longer alone. He was never alone. A gang of other people have filed out of the caravans and are following us back towards where I'd parked the car, then starts off the chorus of, Where do you think you're going, love? You haven't paid. He told you fifty quid, get your purse out, or we'll get it out for you. My kids were on the verge of tears at that point, and if I'm being honest, I wasn't far off either. I gave in, took out my purse, and started sifting through it to see if I had 50 in notes on me. Right as I'm doing that, this kid, this actual bloody child, just snatches the whole thing out of my hand and runs back towards the caravan with it, only to be goaded on by the gang of skanky-looking grown-ups going, Good lad, 
Then I'll teach her. She needs to learn some generosity. It is Christmas, after all. I didn't do a bloody thing. Well, aside from getting in the car and driving off. The damage control from that bit of horribleness was a lot of work. I'm pretty sure it was the singular event that broke my eldest kid's belief, and we had to reassure my youngest over and over that he was just a bad man pretending to be Santa, and that the real Santa would most definitely be putting him on the naughty list for what he'd done. But honestly, I think it's me that belongs on the naughty list for putting my kids in that position in the first place, and for putting myself on the most terrifying Christmas-related event I'd ever gone through. Far, far scarier than my first Christmas with my mother-in-law, if you can believe that. This happened to my family when I was about 12. We live in a small, close-knit southwestern town. My house is pretty small, one story and about 100 years old. Family of four, my parents, me, and my younger brother by about five years. We used to leave our front door unlocked, mostly because we didn't ever think something like this could happen in our town. It was Christmas night, so we all went to bed pretty early since we're more of a Christmas Eve type of family. Me and my younger brother had each gotten $200 cash from my grandpa to help pay for summer camps as a Christmas gift, and it was sitting in my mom's desk drawer inside her very tiny office. At some point during the night, that money was stolen, along with my mother's car, which was promptly crashed down the street. I was asleep on the living room couch, which is right next to our front door. Important note, our front door is loud. It's made of really old wood and is super heavy, and so it creaks almost every time you open it. Our two back doors were locked, so they must have come in through the front. Basically, whoever it was must have walked within a foot of me to get inside the house. That's creepy and off-putting, but what really gets me is my mom's car. My mom keeps her keys in her jacket pocket, which hangs inside my parents' bedroom on the wall across from their door. Again, you have to walk within a foot of my parents' bed to even get there. But even if my parents had slept through a nearby intruder, how did they know where my mom kept her keys and where she hung her jacket every night? It's not an obvious spot to put your keys and they apparently knew exactly where to go. Even grabbing the cash from the desk drawer makes sense. A lot of people keep important stuff there. The car thing just doesn't make sense to me. They crashed it right down the street, like literally into the telephone pole at the end of our street. So we figured they were probably drunk, which raises even more questions. How were they able to open our super loud door and walk right by me without me even noticing? And how were they able to steal the cash and my mom's keys from right under our noses? Both me and my mom assume that it's probably someone we knew or know, but we have no idea who it would be, and we probably never will. This story happened a long time ago when I was about seven. I don't think I have ever told it to anyone, and it was a very short incident, but it's been in the back of my mind ever since. Typically, my cousins would babysit me and my sister during summer and winter breaks. They were about 10 years older than us, maybe 15 to 17 at the time. One day, about a week before Christmas, they took us to the mall to do some shopping. This was one of the largest malls in my area, and it was usually always very crowded, even more so during Christmas time. The day went fine, and they even bought me a small ball, which I started playing around with by bouncing it on the floor and catching it as I walked. Because of this, I was walking behind them, distracted in my own world. After we had finished shopping, we exited through the main doors, which were the most crowded, and just as we were crossing the street to go into the parking lot, some guy, my guess would be about 40 plus years old, grabbed me by the hand and started pulling me to a van right across the street. I remember the van very clearly. It was one of those conversion vans popular in the 90s with drapes on the window, red with thin gray stripes running through the sides van doors. One of the back seat doors was open and you could see a woman sitting on the driver's seat. She was about the same age as the guy and you can tell that the engine was running. At the time I didn't really know what was going on. I just thought it was weird in a sort of funny kind of way. Why is this guy grabbing me? As I remembered, I thought he just got confused and grabbed me by accident thinking I was his son or something. So I shot in my cousin's name and she quickly looked my way. She was just a few steps ahead and as soon as she sees me, she runs to me,
quickly grabs my arm with both hands and starts shouting as loud as she can. It wasn't until I saw her freak out face that I realized that something bad was happening. As soon as she grabbed me, the guy just lets go, gets in the van and they drive away. They didn't really tell the cop or call mall security. They were teens, so my guess is that they didn't really know what to do. They were just happy nothing happened. As I said, this was a very crowded day. As I got older and reflected more on what happened that day, I would understand more and more the severity of the situation. I wonder what would have happened if my cousin hadn't heard me calling her name within all that noise and multitude that was crossing the street with us. I wasn't even shouting out at the top of my lungs, I just called out her name rather calmly. So I was very lucky that day. But later that year a kid was kidnapped in a local park. It was a very famous case that made headlines all around the county. They never found the kid, and I've always wondered if it could have been the same guy. My grandfather suffered from Alzheimer's disease and passed away two days before Thanksgiving. My grandmother is now living alone, so my mom has spent a lot of time over there keeping her company and helping her out around the house. She went to her house on Christmas to go with my grandmother to church before the rest of the family got there, and while my grandmother was getting ready, my mom was in the kitchen on her phone checking Facebook. Out of nowhere, this old Christmas music box in one of the bedrooms started playing by itself. It was the very last part of the melody to Silent Night, Sleep in Heavenly Peace. It played that one line at normal speed and just stopped before it could loop. I'm a skeptic and no music boxes can do this for various reasons, but hearing that it only played that one line makes me want to believe that it was my grandfather letting his family know that he was at peace and no longer suffering. Just wanted to share this story because even if it's just the mechanism becoming unjammed, it gave my mom a feeling of peace and relief when it happened. Either way, the story both touched and freaked me out at the same time. Hearing that would have given me goosebumps. I'm currently 18 and my dad passed away in an accident when I was very little in 2005. A couple of years ago on Christmas, my brother, mother, and me were watching a corny Christmas movie on Netflix for the fun of it. It was the 1998 version of Jack Frost, where a father dies in an accident but comes back to life as a snowman to be with his kid. In the other side of the room we were in, my mom had an iPod that was hooked up to a speaker. Near the end of the film, there was a scene where the dad acknowledges that he has to pass on and tells his family he loves them as he starts to melt. During this exact scene, the iPod somehow turned on by itself and started playing loud music, which startled us a little. We were kind of silent for a while after that, and we never since talked about it. I think I can only remember it happening one time other than that, which was in the middle of the night while everyone was sleeping. Maybe it's a coincidence, but it's pretty odd that it happened at that exact moment on Christmas. We've moved multiple times since his death, too, and that happened in a relatively new apartment. If it was him, it was a pretty sweet thing for him to do. Before I go into depth about this story, it's important to know that I've been dealing with depression ever since I was 12 years old, and as time passed, it's got progressively worse. It's also important to know that at the time that this happened, I was in a toxic relationship and it heavily affected my mood. On to the story. This happened in December of 2015. I was 16 years old at the time and my depression was once again taking a dip for the worst. Despite this, and despite the toxicity of my relationship at the time, I did my best to talk with my family about the holidays. I don't have the best relationship with them since I'm usually a quiet person around them but on that month, both my parents told me something curious. The first account came from my dad. He told me that a few months before December, he had been driving home at around 8pm, so everything was dark and the streets were barely lit with lampposts. The neighborhood I live in is a quiet one, but we have very few lampposts in our street, so walking outside at night can feel really creepy. There are neighbors who own dogs, large ones, but they're almost always quiet too. So my dad was driving down the street and as he turned onto our street, 
He said he saw something in the middle of the road. He had trouble making out what it was, but he described it as a large black dog. He said it was really furry and that its ears were upright, but when I asked if it was just a stray dog, he looked at me wide-eyed and shook his head. He said this dog was abnormally huge, bigger than any other dog he had ever seen. Its eyes were piercing through him as he continued to drive, but as my dad came closer to the dog, it stepped out of view. My dad had never spoken about it until about a week ago, and even then he hadn't actually told me about it before. The only person he had told was my mother. My mom is very afraid of black dogs because of an incident from her childhood, so when I asked her about my dad's experience a few days after, she told me she froze slightly and admitted that she had seen it too. Her experience was very similar to that of my dad's. They were both coming home late at night. She had just come back from working out at the gym when she said she saw a huge black dog on the sidewalk. She, however, asked me if I knew if any of the neighbors had any black dogs, as I tend to walk around more and greet the neighbor's dogs if they're friendly. I told her that there was one, but it was just a black lab. It was a medium size and chubby, far from the description that my parents had given me. When I told her, she looked at me frightened and asked that I look into it. She's a very superstitious woman, while I tend to rationalize situations more. Maybe that's why this scares me so much. About a week after, she came up to me again, terrified. She asked me if I had ever looked into the black dog. I told her I had, and that I only remember the American version of the black dog, that if you see it once, it means joy, and if you see it twice, it means sorrow. I never told her about the third part, though, as I knew she would go ballistic if she knew. From what I read, if you see the dog a third time, it means death. Anyways, when I asked her why, she told me this. The day prior to her asking me, she went to a Christmas party with a few friends, and one friend had offered to help her bring back some food home, as the rest couldn't. It was soup. After her friend had helped her, she was going back to her car when she suddenly called my mom. My mom answered, and her friend was already driving away from our house, but in the middle of the conversation, she abruptly asked if we had let our dog outside. We do have a dog. She's a tiny white Maltese, and we love her to death but we don't let her outside as she was never fully trained. My dog asked, What dog? To which her friend said, There was a black dog on your doorstep. It was sniffing the door and looked like it wanted to go inside, but it was a really big dog. Was it yours? My mom didn't want to scare her friend, so she told her that it was probably just a stray. But my mom had the feeling that it was the same black dog that she and my dad had seen. I didn't know what that meant, with the dog being on our doorstep and all but I later put the pieces together, and here's why this scares me. On the 22nd of December, I had attempted suicide. I won't go into too much detail as to what pushed me to attempt suicide, but it did come from both depression and the state of my relationship as a whole. I was very, very close to dying and had never told anyone in my family. I don't think I ever will. When I asked her when she saw the black dog, she told me she saw it on the 21st of December. The second she told me, I felt a huge pit form in my stomach. I did my best to hide my horrified expression. I kept saying to myself that this has to be a coincidence. There is no way that that black dog had anything to do with me nearly dying. But, looking back on it now, it is a really strange coincidence. It's a full year later. I'm 17 years old and doing much better than I was last year. I only remember the story because yesterday was the 22nd of December. I still don't know what to think. This is something that happened about six months ago. For some background, I grew up in a religious household, which means my family believes in the supernatural. Spirits, angels, God, the devil... We believe it. My parents have told me stories and I have my own stories with dealing with the supernatural growing up. I could see things when I was young and as I grew up every now and then, I would see something in the house. I also have stories of sleep paralysis, astral projection, and lucid dreaming if you're interested in hearing about those another time. Now on Christmas of 2015, my then fiancé bought me a huge panda bear that was almost as tall as me. I loved it and slept with it in my bed. After we got married and I moved into his apartment, there wasn't much room for the panda, so we placed it into the storage closet. 
Now what happened this day is something that has not happened to me in over a decade. After moving in, I kept feeling weird sleeping in the bedroom, especially when by myself. I always got that strong sensation that something or someone was watching me. I just brushed it off because I figured that the feeling was being in a new place. When this night my husband woke up out of the blue and saw me shaking as if though I was having a seizure. He was going to call 911. When I woke up, sat right up, and gasped. I see a white hooded figure standing over him on the right side of the bed, peeking at us. My heart is bursting out of my chest. It's been a long time since I've seen an entity. He asked what was wrong. I said there's something looking at us. He turns to look in front of our bed where the TV stand is, and he says it's sitting on the table. Immediately he grabbed me and began to pray in Jesus' name and rebuke whatever spirit it was. It did go away, but neither one of us could sleep the rest of the night. We stayed up discussing what he saw and what I saw. While what I saw was a white hooded figure, his was a black hooded figure crouching on the table. The next morning he says, Do you think the panda had something to do with it because I get an eerie feeling when I walk past it? I tell him I feel the same way whenever I look at it too. Even our dog barks at it and tries to attack it. We contemplated the whole day on whether or not we should throw it out. So the following day he goes to work and I'm alone with the dogs. I decide to cleanse the house using the anointing oil my parents gave me and pray. Every time I walk past the closet with the panda and say Jesus, my whole body would get cold and I would have shivers and goosebumps all over. I called my husband and told him what happened and when he came home he threw it out. It felt a little better in the apartment but not too long after things started happening again. So I had my dad come over and pray and things were much better after that. So for almost two weeks things were calm. Our upstairs neighbor is a strange woman who never leaves her house and hardly sleeps. I can hear her around 1am moving stuff and walking around every single night. I always get weird vibes from her. But anyway, when my husband first moved in, she gave us some groceries. Fast forward to a few days after my dad comes and prays, she gives us a chew toy and snacks for our dogs. Shortly afterwards, that feeling of being watched returned. And that night, I had just dozed off when I felt the bed shaking. I look at my husband, and he's shaking just like I was in the previous incidents. I look over by our closed bedroom door, and this humanoid creature is crawling on the ceiling trying to hide in the darkness of the corner. It was hard to make out, but I know it was a grayish dark color and had some type of small horns. I didn't know what to do at this point. I'm not as spiritually strong as my parents, so just praying wouldn't be good enough. I turn on a song called Jesus, 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 and put it on low on repeat and was able to fall back asleep. I've long thought it had something to do with whatever my neighbor is into. It's usually the same time she wakes in the early a.m. is when I get that eerie feeling of being watched. Something I also notice between these two incidences is that I always lucid dream, meaning I know that I'm dreaming and can manipulate my dreams and even sometimes drag them out longer when I want. I've been doing this since I was around 8 years old. I also always remember them when I wake up. During these two occurrences I didn't lucid dream and believed what was going on was actually reality. Plus after waking up I couldn't remember what happened in them. It felt as whatever that spirit is was implanting those dreams in my head. I threw out the dog toy and had both my parents come back and pray and do a cleansing with the oil. Now every now and then if I don't pray throughout the house that feeling comes back and I see shadows move out of the corner of my eye. So I have to constantly pray and anoint the house every few weeks. Our lease is up in April and hopefully we can move by then. This happened on Christmas Eve just about a year ago. I was visiting my family on my stepdad's side with my biological mother, and after most of my relatives had left, I found myself with a photo book in my lap. My mother, myself, and my stepdad's father were sitting around looking at photos. There was a picture of this one woman with dark brown hair that struck me as familiar. I remembered her as a child. I vividly remember her leaning down and speaking to me, asking me how I was, and etc., I also remember that she worked at a Galahans gas station as I had seen her numerous times when my stepdads would go in and buy cigarettes. As I had recalled this to my stepdad's dad, he looked at me with an expression of complete confusion 
and maybe then, fear. He told me that I was correct about where she had worked, but it had been nowhere near where we lived. He also told me there was no way I would ever have known her, considering the fact that she died of a brain aneurysm in his bathtub back in 1993. I'm 16 now, meaning I was born eight years afterwards. There would have been no way of meeting her, but, but apart from the fact that this woman died in his bathtub, in the same house we were sitting in, what still chills me to the bone and makes me wonder is how I had known exactly where she had worked, and why had I seen her as a small child? I go to an all-girls boarding school, and there are nine junior and four senior boarding houses. The junior houses are for girls between 11 to 16, and the senior houses are for girls 16 to 18. At the beginning of September 2016, I moved out of my junior house into my new senior house, which, for the sake of not bringing my school into this, we'll call Robinson. Robinson was different from the other houses in that you only stayed for a year, but that you stayed with another person in a double room, as opposed to the single rooms like other senior boarding houses, and I chose to share with my best friend, Georgia. For various reasons, I ended up going back to school two days early with only a handful of other girls. I get told to go to my room, and I discover that it's in the basement of the house, tucked into a corner with two other rooms. The minute I was in the room, I felt something was off, like really, really off. It was like there was this nasty aura in the room, like I wasn't alone in the room. I'm really into ghost stories and the paranormal, so all those stories started to kick in. That being said, I have pretty bad anxiety so I told myself it was that and tried to ignore it. I unpacked and, since Georgia isn't there yet, I get to pick which one of the beds, which desk and which drawers I want. I chose one that's on the far side of the room, with the end facing the open doorway that leads to the space where you can either turn right and go to the toilet, or go left and go to the door to the rest of the house. This room is absolutely huge, so I can space out my stuff, and I'm pretty happy about it. At about 9, I decide that enough's enough and I should go to sleep. I turn the main lights out and get into bed and try to go to sleep and pull the duvet over my head. I then proceed to spend the next 5 hours absolutely terrified. That feeling that something's in the room is amplified a thousand times and it's made worse by the fact that I can hear things. Shuffling in the dark, soft scratching on the carpet and creaks of people sitting on wood. I'm absolutely sure that I've heard someone breathing near my head at some point during the night. I'm so terrified that I have to psych myself up to even change position, sure that something will jump onto me. I'm exhausted in the morning, and when I finally woke up, I realized that although it's not as strong or as powerful as during the night, the feeling that something is in the room with me is still there. It's awful, like something is hanging onto my back and waiting for me to turn my back so it can jump at me. My roommate comes back about three days later, and I notice she hardly seems to notice the atmosphere in the room, which seems so painfully obvious to me, and happily puts away all of her stuff. That feeling that there's something in the room was honestly terrifying. I couldn't study in silence, I had to have music on so that I could attempt to block out this feeling, and I always left my phone on with YouTube videos playing when I had to go to the toilet, just to make me feel like if I came back out into the room, I wouldn't have to see something standing in the room, silently waiting for me. It sounds really stupid, but it was the only way I could reassure myself. The feeling that I was being watched was always most clearer at night. It's probably because I was on my own and didn't have anything else to do but try and go to sleep, but whatever reason, it genuinely scared me. I'd asked in other rooms in the house, there are four floors in total including the basement, and been into other rooms and it feels like a nice normal room and nobody in them ever felt like they were ever being watched. The worst place where it happened was the open doorway, the one that my bed faces. In the beginning, it was easy to ignore, the feeling of being watched only happening every now and then, but as time went on, it got worse and worse. At the worst, it felt as though a grown man was standing in the doorway, barring the way, staring at my bed, and it was as though I could physically feel the presence there, it was so strong. One night, when it was particularly bad, I tried to shrug it off and get to sleep. I have a habit of bringing up one leg to my chest for a bit and then bringing it back down. That night, I brought my leg up, felt the presence, brushed it off, and began to lower my leg back down. As I did, to my absolute horror, 
I felt the edge of the mattress sink downwards as though somebody had suddenly sat on it, and I felt what felt like a hand resting on top of my foot. Straight away I brought my legs to my chest and curled up like that for the rest of the night. I was really on edge from that, so for the next few weeks I made sure to check the doorway before to reassure myself that there's nothing there. About three weeks later, Georgia and I are talking about a play we both like, and since our beds are on the opposite sides of the room, I sometimes couldn't make out what she was saying. Anyways, Georgia makes some point, and I couldn't hear what she said, so I turned over from my position of facing the wall and lift up the duvet to face her bed. I lift my head, and I see a dark shadow above her desk of drawers, floating above the books she has on top of it. We had the curtains open, so a shriek of light from a street lamp was shining through the window into our room, since our windows open out onto the car park, and in it, I could see the shadow was in the shape of a head and shoulders, with the head facing the window, all in pitch dark shadow, so I couldn't make out any features but what seemed to be a prominent Roman nose. I freaked out, yanked the duvet over my head and faced the wall. It felt wrong, you know, like something that shouldn't be there. It really set me off, and since then I got really wary of something actually being in the room, and there are two other incidences that occurred and convinced it for me that something was in the room. The first was when I was under my desk, looking for some socks to wear to dinner, and as I dragged myself out of the desk I reached behind me for my jumper and glanced to see where it was, and as I did, I got a glimpse of a light blue woolen peacoat standing directly behind me, just above my shoulder, so close that I saw the way the light glinted in the buttons, and I could only make out just that the arms of the coat were inside the pockets. I stood up as fast as I could, and I saw that the coat, and presumably the wearer, had vanished. I didn't even hesitate and just legged it out of the place, and refused to go back in for another hour until I knew that my roommate was back in the house. The worst incident was also the last. It was Sunday morning, and we're allowed lions. I was asleep when suddenly I became aware of the fact that I was asleep and lying in bed. I suppose it's what you could call a lucid dream, but I'm not sure as it's never actually happened to me before. I didn't have enough time to focus on it because next thing I knew, there was a feeling of something being near me, and then a feeling that something was by my head, and I felt a presence standing by my head, leaning over me, so solid that it felt like another human being was right there, even through the fog of my sleeping mind. I didn't have enough time to realize what was happening until I felt a hand, a solid warm human hand touch my head and the bit just under my ears and start to stroke it, and I swear to Christ and back again that a voice began to make a noise in my ear, like a weird moaning sound, or like someone was sobbing with their mouth closed, muffling the sounds of sobs. I wasn't sure if it was real, but I sure wasn't taking any chances if it wasn't a dream, so I twisted myself away from it and screamed out loud, Georgia, Georgia. Georgia bolted up and looked around as I tore my covers off and looked around my area. She looked really confused as though she hadn't seen anything and I thought that maybe it had been a dream, until I noticed that my wall calendar that was pinned up to my notice board above my head had been ripped off the wall and was lying on the floor by my bed, despite the fact that it was definitely pinned up securely the night before. It never got as bad as that again. The feeling of being watched slowly began to stop after that, and the negative aura in the room and the small sounds I would have heard in the night started to stop as well, and when I came back from the Christmas holidays in January, it was barely here. The presence had all but vanished, and it felt like the rest of the dorm rooms in Robinson. Over Christmas, I decided to do a bit of research into Robinson to figure out what could explain what was going on. I found out that Robinson has been a hotel before my boarding school had purchased it, which is why the rooms were so big and why they still had ensuite bathrooms and you could actually still see the old wallpaper that had been painted over in some of the rooms. The town where my school is was a really big place for spying and espionage during the Cold War and is still to this day has strong links to British espionage and this hotel was very close to places where this would have definitely occurred. The coat I saw matches exactly the kind of coats worn by the Navy during the 1960s. So from what I gathered, and since getting information about the detailed workings of the British government during the 60s is kind of difficult, I like to think that maybe it's the ghosts of someone who lost their life in my room when it was still a hotel during the Cold War, and they're still stuck here, waiting until they can pass on. 
Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and have a safe and fun holiday.